I want to welcome everybody in the auditorium, everybody who's listening or watching online, back to our series, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Now remember, this entire premise of this series is that our uh, emotional health creates the lid to our spiritual growth. That you can only grow spiritually to the level of your emotional health. And this is why you have people in the church for 50 years and you're thinking, what have you been doing this last 50 years? And they've sat in seats, they've listened to sermons, but they've not, they are emotionally dysfunctional. There's a lot under the surface that you don't see that's not healthy. And so we are trying to dive deep this month but remember, you're only going to experience the freedom and the health of the work that you put into it. We give take-home pages. We have connection groups. We have all sorts of stuff. But if you come from Sunday to Sunday and you forget about it, you're probably not going to change much. Um, and I'm glad you're here, but, you're, but you know, our heart is not just church attendance. Our heart is not to fill the seats with a bunch of uh, people. Our heart is to see people transformed and healthy and making a difference for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so um, I, I just want to keep pushing you, and maybe I can make you mad enough to where I light a fire in you to where uh, you begin to apply it to your life. Um, I won't go through all of this stuff. You know, we, we had slogans like our outer life, should be a reflection of our inner life. Pastor James talked about we have to go backwards before we can go forward. Then for part three, I talked about to live healthily means I have to live truthfully. This morning for part four, we're talking about letting go of power and control. Now, how many of you have ever had to help a teenager drive when they had their temps? Raise your hand. Yeah, there's nothing scarier, sorry teenagers, there's nothing scarier than being in the passenger seat without a steering wheel and without a brake. And you're, you know, these official training schools that are smart because they actually have a secondary brake, you know, on that side because they're not dumb. They, 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 get, they get it, and, and I mean, how many of you ever have been doing that, and you were trying to push the brake even though there was nothing there? Yeah. <laughs> you were like, stop! Oh, I remember uh, when we lived out in, in South Lyon, Northville area, one of our neighbors, it was a, a single parent home, and the mom didn't drive, and so the, the, the poor kid had no chance whatsoever, and so I, I agreed to uh, let him take my car, and I was with them, and and we were driving on Eight Mile Road heading towards Beck, and there was about a five mile stretch where there was no, you don't stop, you just go. And you get to Eight Mile, and there's a, there's a traffic light. So he's driving, he's doing good. We get to, we're getting close, you can see the, the, the light at, at back from a distance, and I notice he's not slowing down. And so I, I thought to myself, relax, Jeremy. It's the first time I ever took anybody out driving, and I was in control, <laughs> and as a teenager wise. And he's going, he's not slowing down. And I'm trying to remain calm. I'm trying to remain calm, and he's not slowing down. We're getting closer and closer. And finally, I'm, I'm like, hit the brake, you know? And he slams on the brake, and we came close. I'm like, what were you doing? And I, and I, I'm, and I, I'm just like, wanted to grab control of that. There's nothing harder than when you are in a situation like that, and you don't have control. My heart was beating so fast because there was nothing I could do because he was in control. And one of the hardest aspects of being a mature Christ follower is surrendering control to God. It's almost like, if, we're, if we can just use the analogy, it's almost like God is a teenage driver and we're on the passenger seat and we're going, God, stop, stop, we're going to crash. Or don't you, do you know what you're doing? Or slow, slow down, God, slow down, you're going too fast. Or can you please pick it up, God? You are going very, very slow. What's the matter with you? Or God, why are you going? I know a shortcut. I know a better route to get to the destination. Whatever it is, is we feel like, man, God, I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. And therefore, we lose trust. And one of the, the biggest areas that we take control from God back are these seasons of our lives where God feels distant. Matter of fact, many atheists and agnostics grew up in some level of faith or some um, part of the church and they 
had some element of, of hope and yet they hit a situation in their life and maybe they lost a loved one or they went through a tragedy. They, they had some kind of moment in their life where they couldn't reconcile intellectually the situation they were going through and the fact that God is good and so they completely walked away. So how do we faithfully follow Christ and how do we grow when we go through situations where God feels distant? And I've seen it time and time again as, as a pastor now for so long. Somebody crosses a line to relationship with Jesus. And, and when you do that, God is, for the very first time, think about it, for the very first time, the light bulb in your spirit comes on and you, are, you realize that you're connected in relationship with the creator of the universe. I mean, talking about a rush. It's like a roller coaster. I mean, you experience the presence of God in a tangible way for the very first time, and we, and we just love that moment. And then after about a year, God starts to mature us. And we're going to break this down in a minute. And I've seen many, many people walk away from God because God felt distant. I've seen people grow bitter or become disillusioned because they went through something that they couldn't explain. And so they, they, they close their hearts out to God. I mean, why would God allow all this to happen in our lives when we're actually trying to pursue Him? Why does every Christ father have to go through pain even though God is still good? Why does it seem like the closer I get to God, the greater challenges I face? And what do we do right now if you're in a season where you're doing all the right things and yet it feels like God is distant? I want you to go on a journey quickly with me this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, like Lisa said, is there's two parts of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. If you have an old school Bible and you plopped it in the middle, you'll probably come in Psalms. In Psalms 37... And we're going to start off looking at verse 34. And we're going to see that every, listen to this, I want you guys to listen to me. Every Christ follower has to go through a season called the dark night. Or it calls hitting a wall. It's that season where it feels like God has abandoned you. It seems like God doesn't care. It seems like God is disengaged. It seems like God is disinterested. It seems like all the stuff that you were taught from Sunday school or children's church and you grew up and it seems like it all was fake. Every single one of us has to walk that road. And during this season, we have two options. We either call it quits or we continue to move forward. Or in the, in the verbiage of of what we're talking about, emotional health, we either give up or we grow up. Every week at Why Not Family Church, we have a slogan. It's kind of like the main theme. I have you repeat. So if you could repeat this morning's slogan with me this morning, a lot easier than the other one. Say, faith must grow beyond feelings. Yeah, faith must grow beyond feelings. Look at these. I want to show you kind of a, a six stages that Peter Scazzaro proposes in his book. And these aren't all like chronological like this necessarily. They intertwine. But, but first, you, you experience a life-changing awareness of God. That's when you cross the line to relationship with Jesus for the first time. And your world becomes turned upside down in a good way. Then number two, stage two is called discipleship. And that simply is the process of becoming like Jesus, where he's molding you and shaping you. And he's, in, he's beginning to change your character. And people, I've heard people say, Bef I would never go to church before, but now I love going to church, right? There's been transformation. God is changing the way you think. He's changing the way you talk. He's changing your heart. And, and people who are prejudiced are no longer prejudiced because of the love of God that's working in their life. And then you have the active life where you are starting to realize that life's not about you. <laughs> uh, and that you realize that, wait, the world doesn't revolve around me. I'm not, you know, that I'm not the center of the universe. God is, and I exist to bring him glory, and I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve. And we, we define that here as fun at Wyandotte Family Church, one of our core values, faith, family, fun. And then, then at stage four is the wall and the journey through the wall. And that's the season where God seems to be nowhere around. It's a season in the Bible where Joseph was in prison. 
and he's praying. And you can see that, you know, he's like, why is this happening to me? It's the seasons that we go through where, where many people quit. Many people walk away from God. But then if you journey through the wall, the next two stages are absolutely a blast because you begin to realize that my faith must go beyond feelings and you have a new depth and a new vibrancy in your relationship with God. And so this psalm that we're about to read in Psalm 37, uh, verse 34, is written by King David. And some interesting uh, note here, it's an acrostic poem and at each stanza in the entire psalm is the beginning, uh, begins with the successive letters of the Hebrew, al Hebrew alphabet. So he kind of goes through the whole Hebrew alphabet throughout the psalm. And if, and if you read the entire context of the psalm, David is struggling because his cur current circumstances that he's going through doesn't lend him to believe that God is good. He knows it intellectually, but he's going through circumstance and it's, and, and through that moment, it feels like God is not good. And it seems like God is not with Israel. And it seems like the wicked are getting away with a bunch of evil deeds and the righteous are suffering. And in this season, following God and staying close to him can feel like a waste of time and energy, if we're just honest. But faith must grow beyond feelings. And look at this one verse in verse 34 at the end of Psalm 37, it says, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. And, and I want to highlight quickly two things that when, if, if you are going through the wall right now, if you're going through the season of the dark night and, and, and if, you, if you're not or you haven't, there's going to come a time where you do. And, and these are two very helpful things to help us make it through those seasons. And the first one point is this is wait for the Lord. You know, David said, wait for the Lord. I think about like Christmas time, like when I, uh, everybody has their different traditions, everybody has their different, you know, um, things that they do. And for growing up, for Christmas Eve, we always went over my grandmas and grandpas in Lincoln Park. And I was always at the kids' table. I never made it to the adult table. Hold on, let me have a moment here for myself. My brother made it to the adult table. I never made it to the adult table. And, uh, and so we always finished eating first. And, and as soon as we were done eating, we went to the living room where my grandma had the tree just packed with presents all around it for me and my brother and my cousins. And I never forget, like it felt like the adults took so long to finish their food. You know, we would scarf our food down and yet we were waiting in the living room with anticipation, sometimes bouncing off the couch and getting in trouble. But whatever it was, we were eager. We could not wait for the adults to finish eating. And that's kind of what to wait for the Lord means. You know, the Hebrew word for wait in this verse means to look earnestly or to hope with expectation. So waiting isn't this is passive, well, I don't, and I'm just going to sit here and do nothing, but it's no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we're earnestly expecting and looking for God to intervene. Like we know that he's going to intervene, and so we're just waiting for the timing of which that is going to happen. So to wait for the Lord means no matter what situation is, I'm going to hold on to his promises with faithful expectation. And in order to exercise this kind of faith, we have to be in situations that require for us to wait and trust. Like we can't flex this muscle unless we're in a situation that requires us to flex the muscle. And so God puts us in these situations of the season of what Schizero calls the dark night where he, God, feels like nowhere to be found. Every Christ follower has to go through seasons where God doesn't seem to make sense, where God seems distant and where, where it feels like what we're doing is in vain. But this season of the dark, white, dark night or hitting the wall requires that we wait on the Lord because faith must grow beyond feelings. But then secondly, David said this in Psalm 37, uh, 34, he says, wait for the Lord and keep his way. This is very interesting that he said that because the Hebrew word for keep means to guard, to observe, or to give heed to. I mean, right now I have a three-year-old named Benjamin and he's a blast, but don't you dare play with one of his toys if he hasn't given you permission, right? I mean, if you have little kids, you know what they say, it's what? mine. 
It's mine. They guard their stuff really well. This morning, I don't know why I did this, but I, I get up really early on Sundays and I was practicing my, my message and I had my son's blanket around my shoulders because I don't want to go back into the room because I was lazy and get my robe. And so I'm practicing with, the, with my son's blanket around my shoulders and he wakes up and he's like, uh, da, 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 Dad, why do, you have, why do you have my blanket? I'm like, because I'm cold. And he walks over, he's like, hey, yours is right here. Use yours, right? Give me my blanket. And, uh, and so we, we swap blankets. I got my Michigan blanket on, and uh, I paused for a moment. Thought of all my state fans, friends. Anyways, let's move on. Okay. Um, but I put my Michigan blanket on. But we, he was protecting, and he was guarding and, and that, that, that's really what keep his way is, is while we're waiting on the Lord, we're called to protect everything that God is doing and everything that he has done in our lives. What I mean by that is we continue to protect what we know is right and we follow and obey his word even when it feels like it's in vain. We keep doing what we know is right even though it feels like God is nowhere to be found. We keep following the right path because we know we're protecting his way. And every single one of us goes through this. I remember when I was at Bible college, I've shared this story three or four times, but I keep sharing it because there's new people in the church. Because I went through a season when I was at Bible college where God felt distant. And I was praying, I was reading my Bible, I was fasting, I was doing all the, the right things. And yet God was, I mean, literally, I felt like I was praying to a wall. I heard nothing, I felt nothing, I sensed nothing. And, and I, in my Bible college, I had to go to chapel every single day. So I went, to I went to chapel five days a week. I had to go to Wednesday night church, Sunday school, and Sunday morning and Sunday night. So I was in nine services a week for uh, four years, which I loved. It was awesome, by the way. But so, so you imagine somebody who was going through the dark night. And we were also in a moment where there was a lot of uh, exuberancy and worship. And people were crying. People were excited. People were happy. People were dancing. And I felt zip. And I remember I was in one service. Um, and there was people crying, doing all this stuff, laughing and happy. And I was just sitting there. And I got, it built up so much agitation in me. And I, and I literally, I just punched a pew in front of me. There was a pew, not chairs. And I, went, I was like, bam! Now, obviously, if you know me, that's not characteristic of me. I don't just punch chairs or pews. And, uh, and, and I did that, and my friends just stopped. Could you imagine if you saw that in your, in, your, in your aisle during worship when Michael's on the stage? What would you do, right? You look over thinking, what's wrong with that person? And my friend came over and said, Jeremy, what, are you okay? And I remember saying, no, I'm not. Well, obviously, I wasn't. And he said, well, what's the matter? And so I began to, you know, pour out my heart to him and tell him that God felt a million miles away and it didn't seem fair that everybody else was all happy, everybody else was all experiencing God's presence, everyone else was all being touched by God, you know, in miraculous ways and God was not listening to me. You know, Peter Scazzaro says, as critically important as it is to pay attention to our feelings in order to know God, we talked about that, the dark night protects us from worshiping them. Our feelings are important and we have to process them and we have to identify those. The last three messages were about those. But going through this season keeps us from worshiping our feelings. That, that when we go through seasons where God feels distant and we can't understand what he's doing or why he allows situations in our life, the psalmist says to wait for the Lord and keep his way. We keep his way. We actively wait on God while we keep his way. And the one scary thing I've seen over and over again the past eight years here in Wyandotte is people hit this season of their lives and they start to pull away from the church family. I've seen it time and time away. It's just natural. Like the devil wants to isolate us always. And so when we go through seasons where it feels like our prayers aren't being answered, like God isn't listening, we don't feel any, any tingles during worship. Nothing's going right. And, it, and it, everything inside of us wants to pull away because God's not there. So we think. This is why David says, keep his way. Don't change what you're doing. Don't stop doing the right things. Don't stop, you know, reading your Bible and praying. Don't stop being faithful in church. 
keep being connected to the body of Christ because I'm telling you, if you're not involved in a connection group during this season, you probably most likely will pull away. And it's just natural. But we need the faith of others sometimes to, to help us. Because you know what my friend did when I punched that thing and I told him what was going on? He, he took me down front after the, the, you know, the prayer time and the, and the altar time. And he says, we're going to get you prayed for. And he took me to a guy to, and, he, and he had this guy pray for me, this one pastor. And then he looked at me and he said, do you feel any different, Jeremy? And I said, no. And he said, okay. He took me down to the other side of the altar and he found another guy. He says, hey, will you pray for my friend? You know, and, and that guy prayed for me and, uh, he looked, and, it, and nothing happened. And then the, the pastor walked away about five steps and he stopped. He looked back at me and I believe it was prophetic word. And he says, in the name of Jesus, let the dam be broken and let the flood of Christ flow through whatever he said. And when he hit that, the power of God hit me and I literally flew to the ground and fell to the ground. And God began to just pour life and healing and, and restoration into my soul. And, but that wouldn't have happened without, without a friend. Somebody linking arms with me. And so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna telling you, uh, we all go through those seasons and you need to be connected or you're going to isolate yourself from the body of Christ. And that only intensifies the struggle and the pain. You know, it's, it's kind of it's like this as we prepare to close. And Jessica, if you can come back up this morning. I'm going to do a quick little object lesson here for you is let's just pretend this morning I know this is kind of a, a, a silly object lesson but pretend with me that this represents Christ and Christ we know like through communion we just took this morning had to go through the dark night when he was there at the garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating blood and he was praying, he says, it, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. There was a lot of pressure and a lot of weight that was going on Christ. And there was a, um, a lot of, of heaviness and he was just feeling a lot of junk. Right? But, here, but here's this amazing reality. Is that Christ goes through a lot of pain, but he bears the weight. He holds the weight. He didn't cave. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He didn't turn his back on, on us. He said, no, I'm going to fulfill the mission that God has given me. I'm going to go to the cross. And then we have us. And this represents us. And we kind of try to take the place of God. And we say, I understand what you're saying, Jeremy, but you know, I, I'm going to handle this. And, and we try to bear the weight of the world on our own shoulders, and this is what happens, right? This doesn't work, does it? I mean, just try it again. Let's just see if I hold it this way. And many of us are just getting crushed month after month, week after week, and we get back up and we try harder and we try to, but we keep getting smashed. But here's the thing. When we're going through the, the trials and the heaviness of life, do you know what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane? Who was he spending time with at the most painful moment of his life? His father. He was crying out to his father. He drew close. And so here's a piece of paper right here, right? And when we have a choice, when we're going through the dark night, we can pull away or we can wrap around. And if we will wrap around our Jesus, if we will wrap around him, then all of a sudden we get a strength to make it through the dark night. Because there always is an end. There always is, you know, there was a story about this woman who was, who was uh, swimming the English Channel. This is a true story. I'm going to give you her name because I know you don't believe me. Her name was Florence Chadwick. Florence Chadwick. And she, was, she wanted to swing the, uh, you know, and, uh, and break all these records. And this fog set in. And she had been swimming. And, it, and the problem wasn't the distance. It was the cold of the Pacific Ocean. And so she was literally... Um, land was in distance and she could have made it but the fog set in and she couldn't see the land and she quit and when she quit and when she got because she was so cold and when she got to you know uh, to dry land and she realized how close she was she was like you know what man I could have made it but if I would have seen the land I would have finished my course so she actually did it again a second time and this time the fog set in and she knew the land was there and so she didn't give up even though she was cold. And she actually broke um, the records and beat the, man, the, the male record by like two hours. 
So here, here's the application is we go through the dark night and God feels distant. It feels like he's not there. And so we want to quit. But if we know there's land, we know the death, we know that Jesus is who he says he is and he does what he says he will do every single time. So even though we can't see him, even though we can't touch him, even though we can't feel him, we wrap around him. And here's what happens. When you wrap around your heavenly father, when you wrap around God and you draw close to him instead of getting away from him, all of a sudden it begins to change for us. And all of a sudden, the same weight that used to crush us now is nothing. Why? It's the same paper. What's the difference? The difference is it was wrapped around something greater. And you and I are going to go through the dark night and you and I are going to face pressure. The only way that we're going to make it is if we wrap around Jesus, if we cling to him, if we don't give up, if we know and keep the end in sight that he is faithful to his promises. And so I want to challenge you, uh, because of time, I'm not going to go through um, the signs of how do you know if you've made it through the, 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 the wall. I want to encourage you, um, you'll get that on your take home page on the way out. There's four signs of how do you know when you finally made it through the wall. Um, what, so make sure you get that. Be a part of a connection group to, to, to discuss that more. But you and I are going to face these moments in our lives. We're going to go through these, these situations. But it says, wait for the Lord and keep his way. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. You know, the worship team's going to come now and, and sing a song as we close. And I just want to encourage you to let this song just kind of settle in. Let the lyrics minister to your heart. And I pray that you, your faith will be encouraged this morning, that our faith must move beyond feelings. That is the maturation process. That's how you get to emotionally healthy spirituality. You know, there's Sundays I come here and I preach and I feel nothing. I see people come up to me, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that message. Or worship was awesome. Thank you for that, you know, having them play that song. And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad it was awesome because I felt nothing. But my faith is not based upon my feelings. It's based upon being wrapped around Jesus Christ. He is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do.